Hello, and welcome to the CEU Democracy Institute RevDem debate, the Polish Constitutional Tribunal Judgment, European Integration in Question. My name is Oliver Garner. I'm the Morris Wool Research Fellow in European Rule of Law at the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law, as well as being an editor of the Review of Democracy, where I'm responsible for the Rule of Law section, and I'll be moderating the debate today. On the 7th of October, the body called the Polish Constitutional Tribunal delivered the oral grounds for the judgment K321 on application from the Polish Prime Minister. This so-called judgment has been shrouded in controversy since its delivery. On the substance, the Constitutional Tribunal found that Article 1 of the Treaty on European Union, Article 3, Paragraph 4 on sincere cooperation, and Article 19 TEU on effective legal protection were incompatible with the Polish Constitution insofar as CGU case law can use this to question Polish judicial independence. In terms of form, the legitimacy of the Constitutional Tribunal is highly doubted. And this has been the case since 2015, when there have been so-called interferences with judicial appointments by the PIS government, leading to judgments such as that of the European Court of Human Rights that found that the tribunal may not constitute the conditions to be a court established by law. RevDem has assembled a panel of experts in EU rule of law to consider the question of whether the judgment does indeed throw European integration into question. First, we'll have Dr. Barbara grabowska moros who is a research fellow at the CEU Democracy Institute. She will introduce the judgment in the context of the wider rule of law backsliding that she has investigated as part of the Horizon 2020 Reconnect project. We will then hear from Dr. Michal Krajewski, who's a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Copenhagen. He will consider the arguments on the implications of the judgment and comparisons to similar decisions by other constitutional courts in light of his research on constitutional imaginaries as part of the ERC Imagine project. The next intervention will come from Dr. Antonio Baraggio, who is an associate professor at the University of Milan and has been editing an iConnect symposium on the judgment. And she will provide observations touching upon the other live rule of law issue in the EU concerning budget conditionality. The final intervention from the panelists will be from Professor Christoph Hillion, a professor of European law at the University of Oslo, who will consider the judgment on the basis of his longstanding research on the rule of law crisis, and in particular, an argument that he made in 2020 about how the Polish government's conduct could constitute notification of an intention to withdraw from the EU under Article 50 and consider whether the judgment could constitute such a notification in light of this argument being revived. After the interventions, we will open the Q&A to audience members. So if you have a question, please enter it as a comment on the Facebook page and we can deliver it to the panelists here. But to start our debate, I hand over to Professor Dmitry Kochinov, who is the head of the Rule of Law Workgroup at the CU Democracy Institute. And Dmitry will kick things off with some opening remarks. Floor is yours, Dimitri. Thank you so much. Uh, it's it's a delightful moment, and uh, at the same time, it's a very sad moment to be bridging all these mushrooming debates about the Polish so-called constitutional tribunal, so-called judgment. Uh, and we have uh, we have representatives of different platforms here uh, who organized uh, in-depth discussions of uh, of these matters. So uh, I myself and several other colleagues uh, contributed to EU Law Life, where there is an ongoing debate on this matter. CEPS in Brussels has an ongoing debate with contributions inter alia from uh, Adam Bodnar, Petra Bart, and other notable, notable schools and practitioners. Then we have, of course, the iConnect blog, which uh, Professor Varadja uh, is, 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 is co-running, which is also interested in the same matters. And of course, uh, Professor Lyon and, and others contributed to Verfassen's blog on the issues which, uh, which we'll be discussing today. So it is probably one of the most commented on decisions, while at the same time, and this will be my main, uh, main uh, opening ball to, to throw into the, uh, into the speakers, uh, the question remains open, just as Oliver has already said, whether there is any decision at all, and whether there is any court at all, and whether the issue of primacy of EU law is at all in question. And this is all because uh, once we leave the realm of EU law, it's absolutely clear that those who are dressed as judges and who present themselves as uh, having authority to speak on behalf of the so-called Constitutional Tribunal of the Polish Republic, in fact, are questioned in the, in the context of Polish constitutional law, EU law, and also ECHR law 
In fact, one of the members of the panel, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, probably there are already more, uh, has been uh, has been expressly named by the European Court of Human Rights as someone who is not a judge, who is a fake, uh, who is parroting as if he is in office, uh, which already uh, throws a shade on whatever the whatever the so-called tribunal has to say. So, so my uh, my opening take on this would be that. Uh, focusing on the supremacy of EU in this context is profoundly misleading. And this is also the, the point that I tried to defend in the EU, uh, EU law life debate. And the, the, it's misleading simply because uh, what is presented to us by the fake so-called judges as, uh, as a conflict between the two legal orders, in fact, is a way to mask and, uh, and to detract our attention from the, from the fact that checks and balances are being absolutely destroyed in the Polish Republic and, 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 and uh, uh, to, to detract attention from, from the fact that Poland doesn't function as a proper rule of law based democratic state. So, uh, of course, this is the bread of the, of the rule of law research group. And uh, I would have preferred to live in a world which doesn't have rule of law research groups. Uh, but as we all read in the, in, in the Federalist Papers, of course, people are not angels. So, so the world is dramatically worse than we would like to imagine it, uh, which is why it's, uh, it's, of course, an honor and pleasure uh, to have this debate and to co-sponsor it with Rev Tam. Uh, so now I leave the floor. And, and probably the last, very last moment, uh, since uh, Christophe, uh, Christophe Lyon and others uh, contributed on uh, Article 50 specifically and whether the decision could possibly uh, be viewed as triggering uh, poll exit, so called. Uh, again, I think, in the light of uh, what I have already said, uh, plentiful problems arise because if it's a non decision by a non court, it's very difficult to argue that it meets any kind of national constitutional requirements as required by the Polish constitution in order to satisfy what Article 50 demands. So it might be against the rule of law and it might be against the EU law uh, to, to make any kind of Article 50 arguments. But now, now I, leave, uh, I leave the floor to the chair. Thank you very much, Dimitri, for setting the floor there and the topics of the debate. Um, I'd like to hand over then to, to Barbara Gaboska moros who will um, discuss the judgment and the wider context of rule of law. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. I will just have not more than 10 minutes. Um... Um, so we could we can move on to Michal and then Barbara, we could come back to you afterwards if the technical problems have been resolved. Michal, would you like to take the floor? Yeah, sure, sure, of course. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for inviting me here. Um, the decision of the 7th of October definitely steered up a heated debate. Blog posts, uh, websites, and Twitter profiles informed that this decision excluded the EU law primacy in Poland, and even consequently that it was a notification of uh, poll exit. Uh, these opinions were formed based on two or three documents that were and are still available in English, a rather complicated operative part of the decision and a press release summarizing the reporting judges' oral motives. The full written motives of this so-called ruling have not been published as of today. Uh, let me just say at the beginning that I fully agree with uh, all the, well, doubts, to say the least, with the composition of the tribunal and so on. But with, in my contribution, I will focus on what, in my view, follows, and perhaps more importantly, what doesn't follow from this decision on its own terms. Uh, extremely far-reaching opinions were expressed by non-Polish commentators on, these, on this decision's alleged consequences. Personally, I find these opinions too far-reaching in light of what we know and what we don't know at the moment. Specific legal effects of this decision and its relation to prior decision of other constitutional courts, in my view, cannot be meaningfully assessed now as we don't know the full motives. In fact, the press release that we have at the moment contains self-contradictory arguments. For instance, it says that the organization of the judiciary uh, belongs to the constitutional identity of Poland. Well, in that case, how could this organization have been fundamentally changed in 2018 via ordinary legislation? Well, that I don't know. Since we don't know if we can take this decision seriously, uh, I think that we should be highly cautious in talking about the imminent poll exit, especially that, in my view, too frequent use of this concept 
desensitizes Polish society. Uh, in this context, I will only provide a few impressions and doubts about the operative part. In brief, I am not sure if this operative part will have any legal effects. Uh, this operative part that we discuss has three points. Crucially, all the points use a so-called insofar as formula, which in Polish constitutional law normally indicates that only some parts of legal provisions or their specific interpretations are removed from the legal order as unconstitutional. To me, uh, this operative part looks like an interpretive decision intended to oppose a specific treaty interpretation favored by the ECJ. But it doesn't look like invalidating entire treaty provisions or the principle of primacy. So point one and point two A state that Article 1 and 40 EU are inconsistent with the Polish constitution if interpreted as meaning that the EU institutions can act outside the scope of their competencies, if meaning that the Polish constitution is to be disregarded, and if meaning that Poland is no longer a sovereign state. The problem is that this bizarre hypothesis is completely empty. It is simply not true. Hence, to me, according to the loss of basic knowledge, the whole sentence is void. Point one, cannot remove from the legal order an interpretation of EU law by the ECJ if, if this interpretation simply doesn't exist. Uh, so to me, point one has no legal effect. As Jakub Jaraczewski noted on Perfasson's blog, and I fully agree with him, point one looks like a bizarre political declaration rather than a court judgment. I think it doesn't change anything in the principle of primacy in Poland. Now, point 2b is interesting. It states that Article 19 TEU is inconsistent with the Polish constitution if understood as meaning that Polish judges can resurrect legal provisions that were repealed by the parliament. It addresses a specific solution or it opposes a specific solution recently prescribed by the ECJ. The problem was what to do if legal provisions on the jurisdiction of the non-independent disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court are to be disapplied. According to the ECJ, in such a case, the old provisions on the jurisdiction of the labor, labor chamber that remains independent resurrect. I have to say that this idea of resurrecting old provisions is not uncontroversial. It was very controversial in Polish constitutional law before 2015. But at any rate, I believe it is still possible for Polish judges to find a way around. It all depends on how the old independent chambers of the Polish Supreme Court or the Supreme Administrative Court will interpret the law to assert their jurisdiction. To me, it's a matter of legal ingenuity and pro-European legal interpretation. So part 2B of this operative part is not fatal to the principle of primacy in Poland, in my view. Point three is the most problematic. It is intended to oppose the recent ECJ case law based on Article 19 TEU, but it doesn't seem to invalidate the entire Article 19. Point three holds that Article 19 is inconsistent with the Polish constitution if understood as granting to Polish judges a power to review the legality of their new colleagues, judicial appointments, uh, appointments made by the new council of judiciary and the Polish president. Uh, so it clearly opposes a specific line of the ECJ case law and attempts to consider it an, or invalidate it as unconstitutional. Uh, I think two things should be noted in this regard. First, uh, the ECJ expressly acknowledged in paragraph 144 of the landmark case AK that under Polish law, uh, the judicial appointments by the Polish president as such do not have to be subject to judicial review and invalidated. The direct effect and the primacy of ECJ case law was always about guaranteeing a fair trial before an independent judge in individual cases. If a Polish judge considers that their new colleagues are not independent or were not appointed in a lawful procedure, 
this does not necessarily mean that this colleague is automatically deprived of office. It means that this colleague cannot guarantee a fair trial, but the removal from office is a matter of national law. What I mean is that point three of the operative part may be based on a misconception in as much as it talks about the judicial review of judicial appointments as such. So to me, depending on what we will find in the written motives, uh, it may turn out devoid of legal effect. Second, the judicial review of decisions adopted by the Council of Judiciary is required not only by Article 19 of the EU, but also by Article 45 of the Polish Constitution, which is equivalent to Article 6 of the ECHR or Article 47 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. It's all about an effective remedy and a fair trial before an independent judge. In fact, there is no provision in the Polish Constitution which makes the Constitutional Tribunal its exclusive interpreter. In fact, the Supreme Administrative Court uh, issued a series of important judgments on the 11th of October, so three days after the quasi-ruling was announced, but one day before it entered into force. The Supreme Administrative Court announced several decisions of the Council of Judiciary relating to judicial appointments to the Supreme Court. Uh, here as well, the full motives have not been published yet. But in the previous judgments of this kind, the Supreme Administrative Court applied Article 19 of the EU, the ECJ case law, and Article 45 of the Polish Constitution in a parallel way. It is surely important to criticize this quasi-judgment for the legal chaos it exacerbates, undoubtedly. But I think it is also important to see uh, to see this quasi-ruling for what it really is, a largely political de declaration with very doubtful legal effects. I think that we need to wait and see how Polish independent courts will approach now Article 19 TEU in their decisions, as we have still an abundance of brave judges committed to the true meaning of the Polish constitution and to European law. And in this context, the talk about legal pole exit uh, in the immediate comments to the ruling seemed to me blown out of proportion. Some commentators implied that the principle of primacy is suddenly switched off in Poland, and I think that is not true. It is true that in the short oral motives, uh, the reporting judge alluded to the possibility of subjecting individual ECJ judgments to ultra virus review. This statement is a clear political message and is very, very troubling. Still, I would call for moderation and academic responsibility. Uh, to me, it doesn't seem reasonable to offer far reaching conclusions on legal pole exit or allegedly comprehensive comparisons between this quasi ruling and uh, German jurisprudence or the German vice judgment based only on a press release because uh, that is everything we have at the moment. So uh, I hope this was a useful introduction to our debate. And uh, again, thanks a lot for inviting me here. Thank you very much, Michal, for that very detailed analysis of the actual potential legal effects of the judgment. And perhaps it can show us a, kind of a very careful doctrinal analysis of very politically sensitive uh, legal documents can actually yield a, a way out of their, of their consequences. Um, we will try to hand over again to, to Barbara, and she can uh, provide some of the, the context of backsliding behind the, the judgment in its detail that Michal has just outlined. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hope this time it will work. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Thank you. So let's start with, with the very beginning of, the, of this case. This case was initiated by the prime minister in March 2021. So it didn't start, you know, during the summer. It was sort of, sort of kind of requested by the prime minister even before. Comparing with other tribunals, it seems a little bit um, um, weird that the executive asks the tribunal for, for the review. It was not a, a parliamentary opposition. It was not individual. It was not a common court. It was the government who asked the tribunal for a favor, meaning for a decision about the EU law, uh, by binding EU law in, 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 in Poland. As Wojciech Sadurski wrote in his great book about Polish rule law breakdown, 
the tribunal is the enabler of of the of, of the of the government and of the ruling party and this is exactly uh, such such um, case there were five hearings between july and um, and october the case was decided by 12 judges and three of them can be considered as fake judges uh, which we already know what kind of consequences may um may raise and I have one question, which I'm going to leave just open for the moment that will probably reinforce our discussion later. I'm not fully sure what was the, the reason why the prime minister asked for this for, for this ruling. First, I thought it was just domestic purpose, you know, political debate. But apparently now it's much broader. And I think we will, will be able to see what are the consequences, both legal and, and political, of, of this mm, decision of, of, the, of the tribunal. And to be honest, if we want to discuss this, uh, this, in this decision or announcement, we need to assume just for next five minutes that it is a ruling so we can dig into and look what was uh, announced. And then we can get back to review what was really the consequence of, of the ruling. Michal already presented quite important elements of, of the ruling, so I'm going to skip those elements which, which are going to be, um, uh, would be similar to, to what was already discussed. But I would like to start with, you know, there were three points of the ruling, and the first one dealt with Article 1 and Article 4, so very basic elements of, of, um, of the treaty. And when you compare this, this, um, this sentence of, 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 the, of the decision with the um, press uh, release that Michal already mentioned, you can find two elements which are really surprising. The first one, according to the tribunal, the CJEU interference in the Polish judiciary violates the rule of law. And on the other hand, when you look at the common court, why they are asking a court of justice for the help for the interpretation, interpretation for the preliminary uh, reference is because they want to fight for the rule of law uh, in Poland. So the same argument was used in a completely different way by, by a different actor of the political debate. The second element, I think it might be really interesting, is that shaping system of the judiciary in Poland is a part of the Polish constitutional identity. Such, um, such statement was not um, expressed um, uh, before. And of course, the tribunal is wrong because the whole case law of the Court of Justice, it's not about you know, the organization of the courts and judiciary in Poland. It's actually about the effective legal protection. So it has nothing to do with, with the competence of, of the member of the member states. The second point was discussed in very details by Michał, meaning Article 1, Paragraph 1, and Article 19, paragraph one and th those those um, issues link with what happens when the court uh, uh, denies to apply the law that is incompatible with the with the EU so I'm going to skip this one but I'm going to move to point number three which I find extremely interesting for for, for our discussion today so the, the article uh, the point the third point of the sentence was um, about article 19 paragraph one subparagraph two and Article Two of the treaty, so about those basic values that are listed in this in this um, provision, um, and the court says that if if the court decides to review the resolution of the National Council of the Judici Judiciary or reviews um, the uh, the appointment of, of the judge, this violates the constitution. And what is surprising is that such procedure of reviewing those resolutions by the National Council of Judiciary, those were binding statutory provisions until 2018. Such procedure existed in Poland until it was um, amended by, by the ruling majority. So the, according to the tribunal, the law that existed until 2018, now it's apparently unconstitutional. So what happens is the tribunal tries to read the constitution in the light of the binding statutory provisions. It's not kind of autonomous understanding of, of, the, of the constitution, but by rather using the law amended by the um, uh, ruling majority to read the constitution in, in such um, uh, way. The second point, which comes to my mind here is if, if you read this, this point, it apparently seems that effective legal protection and independence of judiciary is incompatible with the presidential prerogative, which seems to be absurd when you think about the, the position of fundamental rights in the, in, in the EU uh, human rights um, system. So what is interesting after, after this, you know, very detailed uh, elements of, of the ruling is that according to the tribunal, and the question will be who who could say such statement if, if, if the tribunal already did that, that in the liberal collision between norms requires mutual sincere dialogue. 
it sounds like you know some statements said by the prime minister himself. You no, know, this whole need of dialogue under Article Seven procedure. It seems that it has been um, expressed in this um, in this ruling. And the last point, which seems to be very uh, intriguing in, the, in this ruling, is that sort of um, it's a statement that the. CJ EU case law will be reviewed by the tribunal in future. So they give themselves competence, which does not exist according to the constitution, that the, the, those cases will be reviewed case by case in, in future. Uh, in future, if, if if someone asks for that, let's say prime um, prime minister. There's, however, one point that I, the tribunal makes huge mistake, and that is about um, um, possibility that the CJ EU um, I mean, if the CJEU doesn't stop questioning the status of the constitutional tribunal judges, then we are going to review those those case law, the, 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 that case law. The problem is that the CJEU has never questioned the status of the constitutional tribunal judges. There is no ruling on, on that. The, the only ruling is from Strasbourg. It's a Xero floor um, case. It's not Luxembourg. It seems that the tribunal just kind of made a huge mistake about who's questioning uh, their status. It's not Luxembourg court. So moving to my final um, points, kind of trying to present a broader picture of the rule of law backsliding in, in, in this part of Europe. This case is not about constitutional identity. It's not about sovereignty. It's about the arbitrariness of, of the executive. And I th that's how I can read those, those, those um, elements, especially the third point of, of, this, of this ruling. The second thing, it's not about the hierarchy of, of norms between you know, the EU, the constitutional law. It's not about that. It's actually about the attempt to neutralize the CJEU case law that the executive does not um, does not like. And as I mentioned before, it's also not about the organization of the judiciary. It's about the effective legal protection of, um, of individuals in, under, the, under the EU law. Uh, as a part of the Reconnect project, we tried to follow so-called rule of law practices. And we found at least three types of those, meaning institutional ones, procedural ones and political ones. And I guess this ruling, this announcement, this decision of the tribunal from October the 7th, 2021, it's an extremely interesting example of both of all those three kinds of practices. So we can see how the tribunal who, who usually was uh, perceived as a negative legislator was trans transformed into enabler of the executive or uh, into illiberal constitutional tribunal as one of the scholars from the iConnect discussion described it recently. It's also interesting procedural, procedural um, practice when the Ombudsman office had to defend the binding provisions of the EU law, sort of that it showed up that the assumption and presumption that the law, that this law is um, compatible with the constitution was somehow reversed. And now you had to defend the, 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 these provisions. And of course, it will be interesting to see what, are, what will be the, the political consequences of the ruling. But I guess we will be able to have you no know, chance not only to see, but also to discuss it today. So thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. And, and thank you for leaving this question on the table of the political strategy behind why the Polish Prime Minister might have started engaging in, in lawfare. And also, thank you for pointing out that there could be a future legacy of this judgment if Constitutional Tribunal follows through on its, um, its claims to continue review. So I'll hand over now to Antonio Barraccia to uh, offer her uh, thoughts on the judgment and also perhaps on uh, this uh, ongoing question of rule of law, budget, conditionality. The floor is yours, Antonio. Thank you so much. Can you hear me well? Okay, great. So yes, uh, in my uh, intervention, I will focus on the possible reaction by the European Union institution uh, to the uh, Polish decision. Uh, in particular, I'm going to focus on uh, the activation of the rule of law conditionality mechanism and the non-approval, the possible non-approval of the Polish recovery plan, which are the topics I'm working on. And so it, this is the land under which I can discuss uh, the uh, constitutional tribunal uh, decision. 
decision. So uh, as we all know, the regulation on a general regime of conditionality for the protection of the union budget was approved in December, enriching uh, the European Union rule of law toolbox uh, with a specific mechanism to sanction uh, rule of law breaches, uh, which impinging on uh, the European uh, Union budget. Article two provides a broad definition of the rule of law encompassing legal certainty, effective judicial uh, protection, which includes access to justice by independent and impartial courts. In particular, the new regulation illustrates three situations that may indicate the existence of a rule of law breach, endangering the independence of the judiciary, failing to prevent, correct, or sanction arbitrary or unlawful decision by public authorities, and limiting the availability and effectiveness of legal remedies. There is little doubt that the uh, Constitutional Tribunal decision, uh, also in light of the overall context with regard to the judicial independence uh, uh, in Poland may be considered a breach in the rule of law as defined by Article 2 and Article 3 of the regulation. However, the application of the regulation could not be so straightforward since uh, the Commission need to demonstrate that the rule of law breaches in Poland affect the sound financial management of the European Union budget or the protection of the financial interests of the Union in a sufficiently direct way as required by Article 4 of the regulation. The list of triggering conditions at Article 4, if can be seen as a limitation of the discretion of the Commission, in the end uh, offered, in my view, more clarity on the grounds of activation of the mechanism. And in doing so, also in light of the current case, it might actually contribute to make the regulation more effective. Uh, as even political science studies have shown uh, that the ensuring the determinacy of condition may have a positive impact on the effectiveness of conditionality. Indeed, if we look at uh, the condition enshrined in Article 4 of the regulation, the Constitutional Tribunal decision may impact on several triggering conditions of the regulation, for example, the lack of effective judicial review by independent courts, uh, of action or omission by the authorities, and more in general, it can be considered within the other situation or conduct of authorities that are relevant to the sound financial management of the union budget. But still, uh, the direct link requirement may offer a ground of contestation for the application of the rule of law conditionality mechanism. The intervention of the court, probably in the first month of 2022, might help in clarifying if uh, uh, indeed the criterion of the direct or specific link is a necessary condition for any type of cross-sector conditionality, as also argued by the legal service uh, when he tells that a specific link between an identified deficiency and the inability to satisfy the objectives of a given measure is at the core of any conditionality attached to European funding. As we know, Contestations and tensions have accompanied the regulation since its approval in December 2020. We should not forget that the approval of the regulation has been marked by a hotly debated move by the Council in its conclusion in December to postpone the activation of the mechanism after the European Commission would have introduced guidelines and after the decision of the Court of Justice if appealed under an annulment action. We can ask whether the uh, serious challenge launched by the Constitutional Tribunal decision would not be sufficient to trigger an immediate reaction of the European Commission, reversing the Council conclusion. This will be uh, legally possible, in my view, since the conclusion of the Council are a political statement and they are not legally binding on the Commission, in the sense that the Council cannot be granted the power to interfere directly in the legislative sphere. It's therefore conceivable that the Commission might depart from the conclusion. However, the Court of Justice, as we know, has been vested with the procedure of annulment of the regulation by Hungary and Poland, and the Advocate General conclusion are awaited uh, on December 2, and the decision will soon follow, probably. Uh, this may suggest the Commission uh, to wait for the Court of Justice decision also in order not to escalate the tension vis-a-vis -vis the Polish authorities. Of course, what seems to be a kind of paradox uh, in light uh, uh, of the uh, 
constitutional tribunal ruling is that the Poland recourse to the Court of Justice, uh, recognizing implicitly the authority of the Court of Justice in the case of the procedure of annulment. And in the meantime, the court, uh, uh, the constitutional tribunal decision blames the Court of Justice for its ultra virus interpretation of the treaty. Another interesting note appears if you look at the Polish uh, annulment action. Uh, among the grounds of complaint, uh, Poland argues that the European legislator infringed the principle of conferral laid down in Article 4.1 and Article 5.2. And additionally, Poland indicates that the legislator also failed to fulfill its obligation under the second sentence of Article 4 uh, to respect the essential state functions. Even if under different grounds, the legality of the rule of law regulation is challenged under the violation of the principle of conferral, and it is conceived as an ultra virus claim. Uh, the same action of annulment have its roots in, the, roots in the lack of competences of the European Union, according to the Polish authorities, and the rule of law matters uh, in the member states. We can see a kind of short circuit between the constitutional tribunal ruling, the action of annulment brought by the Polish authority on the same mechanism which would be, have been activated to react to the constitutional tribunal ruling and more in general to the overall breach of the independence of the judiciary. So the Court of Justice ruling is very much awaited early in 2022 and it will probably disentangle this knot. And I move very quickly on the, the other possible immediate action, which can be taken by the European institution uh, in the light of the recovery and resilience facility regulation. The commission could continue to delay the approval of the Polish plan until the Polish government won't take measure to address the rule of law concern ma made by the commission and the council in the country specific recommendation under the European semester. Uh, as we can see, uh, both the rule of law uh, regulation and the recovery uh, and resilient facility regulation rely on the use uh, of the instrument of conditionality as a tool of enforcement uh, where no other legal means seems to be available or effective in case of conflict between the European Union and national authorities. In such a way, we can see that there is a kind of uh, uh, advancing the conditionality as a constitutional virtue, as it has been uh, stated. And if it's true that conflicts over ultimate authority always emerge in constitutional orders, um, uh, and legal orders are even transformed by such conflicts, me, we may wonder where the current uh, persistent tension may lead. The European Union is now dealing with deeper tension that pose challenges to the very nature and the purpose of the integration process. And the widespread use of conditionality uh, may be the symptom of a more radical shift in the European constitutional culture from a legal order based uh, on the keystones of loyalty, solidarity, mutual trust to a legal order based on a new conditionality culture. The fact that it might now be necessary to use conditionality, that there might not be alternative to conditionality can be an interesting sign for the uh, integration process uh, trends showing the flaws of a structure that uh, struggles to keep the member states together. On the other side, conditionality may contribute to a trend of centralization in the European member state relationship. The spending power of the union grows and through that increasingly demanding questions are posed to the states, reducing their scope of action. It is not necessarily a negative effect, on the contrary, in my view, but in fact, it signals how we are in a moment of tensions that is still difficult to predict how it will be solved. And my final point is that, of course, the, the judgment of the Constitutional Tribunal has opened a crack in the EU uh, legal order and it has challenging uh, the future of the European Union as a political and legal construct. This is even more serious uh, in my view because it comes at a time when the European Union is dealing with the accession process uh, in the Western Balkans and one of the key membership conditions required uh, to candidate is the respect for the fundamental values of the European project. So how can the EU demand to candidate what it cannot uphold vis-a-vis -vis the member states? So the future of the EU is at stake and the EU is dealing with the political, legal and the 
existential dilemma. So this is my uh, reading of the uh, decision and the possible uh, action uh, that the European Union uh, can take uh, with the lens of conditionality uh, mechanism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio, for that uh, look ahead to the possible practical responses. And perhaps it's interesting, we've heard a lot about the rule of law toolbox being deficient and perhaps the regularity, the regulation on conditionality, being able to add some bite to that. So we may have a situation where that really will be challenged by what's happened with the judgment here. For our final intervention uh, from the panelists, I'd like to hand over to Professor Christoph Hillion, who he's joining us from rural Norway, and it seems he's, his connection is <laughs> strong enough for him to provide his, uh, his analysis of the judgment. Yeah, the floor is yours, Chris. Thank you, Oliver. Um, I hope you can hear me now. Yes. Uh, thank you also for the, the kind invitation to take part in this very timely uh, round table. Uh, thank you also to, uh, to the CU uh, Democracy Institute, which is getting stronger and stronger and more and more visible. Well done for all the work you're doing. Um, I, I thought I would... Um, uh, deal with uh, two questions and, and raising perhaps a third. The first question is whether we should um, pay attention to that decision in the first place. The second one is uh, whether if we do pay attention to that decision, whether it can indeed be regarded as um, uh, uh, whether it can amount to an intention to withdraw from the European Union as per Article 50. And then um, if not, uh, then what can be done in the meantime? Um, as I said, the third question perhaps is more a question for the discussion, um, although Antonia has already uh, covered quite a lot in terms of what can be done. As regards to the first question, it is indeed very tempting to disregard that decision in the first place. There are many arguments in favour, one of which is indeed the very dubious nature of that particular body that took that uh, decision. Um, as we know from the European Court of Human Rights, but various other authorities, including the European Commission, uh, the, 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 the question of whether the body in question is a court established by law has been, has been raised. So the easy approach would be to say, well, this is not a court. So a force your rider decision is not legal, we can just simply ignore it and move on. The difficulty, however, is, is that first, well, there are several, several elements which make that particular proposition difficult to, to accept. The decision, as we know, has been published uh, on the court's website uh, itself, but also in the official gazette of, uh, of Poland. We can also um, argue that it would appear that the government is definitely um, welcoming it and is acting um, as if it was good law. Um, I mean, you just have to listen to the Prime Minister's speech in the European Parliament to various declarations it made. He made in the context of the European Council meeting of last week, let alone the letter that he sent around to the heads of state or government, the members of the European Council, to get the impression that this is a this is a decision which is taken, uh, which is given uh, authority in, uh, in Poland. Unsurprisingly so, because it was the prime minister himself that looked for that particular, um, uh, particular decision, which is shielding um, the judicial transformation from any interference from the European Court of Justice and EU law, essentially. And what we're seeing indeed is the same government now trying to extend this shield to prevent um, the European Court of Human Rights having any kind of role in what's happening in, 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 with respect to the organization of the judiciary in, in Poland. Uh, so, so I, I mean, put simply, I have the impression that the, the decision is, is, has entered the, the, the legal order of Poland. And indeed, um, I was uh, in Warsaw uh, last week and, and had a few conversations with people who were in the know, uh, telling me that some judges in Poland have already um, incorporated uh, the verdict of the Constitutional Court in their own jurisprudence. I mean, understandably so, given the pressure under which they, they, they adjudicate. I mean, they feel disciplinary kind of um, uh, procedures against them. And so many judges have now started to um, follow essentially what the tribunal has said on the 7th of October. Others are not um, uh, bravely uh, trying to uh, make sure that uh, that uh, the EU obligations of Poland are, are, are respected. 
but what we see indeed beyond the fact that uh, some judges are following it is, is an increasing splitting of the uh, Polish judicial framework with some judges um, basically following the gist of what the tribunal has said, some other judges um, not. And so um, uh, what, what we're seeing is, is, is indeed um, a splitting of the functioning of the Polish judicial um, uh, system. And it's becoming increasingly unclear for uh, people going to courts to know what, what law is applicable across the country and what kind of judicial protection they may benefit from, um, which in turn has a major effect on the whole EU judicial uh, system. So all of this to say that um, the anarchy, confusion and lawlessness that the um, that the prime minister was talking about in the parliament last week, and he was mentioning in his letter to the heads of state or government, that lawlessness, anarchy, and um, and and confusion um, is there. Uh, it's not uh, it's not uh, what the EU would make of that um, decision from the constitutional court that would create that anarchy. That anarchy has been developing ever since that government has been starting its so-called judicial reforms. Um, so all of this to say that, in my view, it is difficult to ignore that decision. It having um, profound um, practical implications in the way in which the Polish judicial framework operates, and it's having difficult, um, uh, profound implications in terms of not really knowing what kind of judicial protection one can get these days in in, in the Polish system. Um, so that brings me to. Um, to, to the next question, now that we can establish that indeed this is a decision that uh, that is difficult to ignore, does it nevertheless amount to the kind of uh, activation of Article 50 that uh, we've been uh, um, hearing in, in some corners recently? I would humbly submit, having um, written a thing or two about the idea of triggering Article 50 in this sort of context last year, I would humbly submit that this, this time around, I mean, in the present situation, Article 50 is, is certainly not uh, triggered uh, because simply the conditions for the lawful activation of Article 50 are not met here. While I'm ready to submit that um, what has happened on the 7th of October might be one step closer to Paul Exit, um, in the sense that it is a further expression of um, the Polish authorities' intention no longer to um, fulfill some of the requirements of membership. Um, there are nevertheless some conditions that need to be fulfilled for a lawful activation of Article 50, one of which is um, enshrined in Article 50, Paragraph 1, namely that decision to withdraw from the European Union has to be taken in accordance with the constitutional requirement of the country. The second condition um, can be deducted from uh, the court's uh, ruling in the famous white man uh, judgment, and that's the, the reference to a democratic process. Uh, the decision to withdraw shall not only be taken in line with the constitutional requirement of the country, but it must be taken uh, following a democratic process. At least that's my humble reading of the white man judgment. Now, one would be forgiven to make a contention that neither of these conditions are fulfilled in the present case. Um, uh, it, it is difficult to rely on the judgment, in quotation mark, of a constitutional court, in quotation mark, to try to give the constitutional credentials to the, move, to, to the moves um, of, of the Polish government in terms of um, reformulating Poland's relationship with the European Union, let alone activating Article 50. Similarly, um, although I, I should be very, very cautious here, given that I'm not uh, Polish and although I go there regularly, uh, my impression is that it's difficult to discern a democratic process at play, which is supporting the anti-EU membership politics of the current government. So all of this to say that I found it quite difficult to make the argument presently that we have, um, we, we are already in the realm of an activated Article 50 uh, procedure, uh, which means that in the meantime, we will have to turn to other instruments at the EU's disposal and at the member states' disposal to try. Um, and um, first of all, um, uh, 
protect Poland's membership against certain actions of its own government, uh, given that the constitutionality and the democratic uh, character of this anti-EU membership action are in question, and, and do whatever we can to protect the citizens' rights of um, Poland across the Union, but also citizens' rights um, of uh, non-Polish nationals in, in Poland. And that brings me to the third question of what, what can be done in the meantime. And some uh, suggestions have already been um, uh, made uh, compellingly by uh, Antonia and various other commentators. Uh, obviously, one has to redouble uh, going after the Polish government using the infringement procedure. Um, uh, Dimitri, among others, have been writing about the interstate infringement procedure, which might be com more compelling. It may more, have more clout in the current circumstances uh, and ensure more potency to the eventual judgment of the European Court of Justice, given that, as we know, the current Polish government has shown no scruples to, um, to disregard certain judgment of the Court of Justice uh, um, in the context of various infringement proceedings triggered by the European Commission. So one has to figure out how to keep a certain potency to the infringement mechanism which, um, whose authority is being damaged by a member state that does no longer want to follow the Court of Justice's verdict, let alone whatever Euro the European Commission is, is doing. Um, so, so that one might be one, one possibility. We, we might go into the details, namely in terms of um, using strategically penalty payments and, and interim orders in order to put pressure on the government uh, in, the, in the discussion, if you, if you like. But beyond this uh, more classic infringement procedure, I think it's high time and at the, at the risk of sounding uh, like wishful thinking, um, it's, it's high time that the other institutions in the EU institutional framework do their bit. I mean, they cannot leave it to the Commission, and uh, which, by the way, they have helped emasculating by the infamous compromise of uh, 2020. Uh, they cannot leave the European Commission and the Court of Justice um, alone in, in handling this profound constitutional crisis. They have to do their, their bit as well, precisely because they have a mandate under EU law to protect generally the EU legal order. So Article 7 obviously has to be used more resolutely, and we can discuss um, in, in what possible ways. Um, and, then, uh, and, and then obviously the, the conditionality mechanisms which could help putting pressure. But I, I think that neither the conditionality mechanisms, the financial cards, nor the classic infringement procedure will be, will be enough here. Uh, and I'm not sure they will come back to the result that we're all looking for, namely compliance on the ground and the restoration of the rule of law in Poland. So we have to be, to be very, very cautious about using those instruments um, and, and perhaps um, try and use more strategically, resolutely Article 7, which might be the last stop before Article 50 is indeed triggered. Thank you very much, Christoph, for that very uh, cogent analysis of the situation and I think an interesting contribution to this debate, which has been growing steam about Article 50 and something for us to consider about that connection with the ongoing Article 7 procedures. So we can uh, move on to the Q&A section of our, of our debates now. And we already have a question from the audience on the Facebook comments, but I'd like to encourage all of the audience members to issue any questions they have in the comments and they will be asked to the participants here. But the first question we have here from the audience is uh, stating that apart from the lack of legitimacy of Poland's constitutional tribunal and the authority of its decisions, what practical impact would the K321 decision have on judicial cooperation between EU member states, such as in the area of European arrest warrants? And I know, me how you've written about uh, judgments concerning Poland and European arrest warrants in the past. So if you're interested in, in answering that, and then we could uh, open up to the other members of the panel. Sure. Of course, thanks for this question. Um, I have to say that to me, in terms of the judicial cooperation in criminal or civil matters, this judgment doesn't change anything. In 2018, as you noted, I wrote, I criticized the Court of Justice for its Selmer judgment. Back then, I thought, and I still think that, um, uh, if judges issue decisions, judicial decisions, under a threat of disciplinary action for the substance of their judgments, 
and this disciplinary action is to be run by the executive, that creates uh, the risk for these judges and there is a problem with executing their judgments um, in other EU member states. Uh, we, we are simply not sure if we can trust these judges because there can always be a freezing effect, uh, a, a threat of political repercussions, etc. And for this reason, I thought that in Selmer, Article 47 of the Charter should have been interpreted as precluding the execution of judgments issued in this particular set of circumstances as we have in Poland now. And in this respect, my opinion has never changed and this judgment doesn't change anything in this respect. Thank you very much, Michal. Um, we have Barbara and Christoph, both have uh, interventions to make. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think there are two perspectives. The one is from the of the domestic court that deals with the Polish case, and the other with the possibility that the court of justice will hear the case again because there will be, you know, again an, another preliminary reference from domestic court. Um, from the perspective of you know Irish, German, or any other other court, uh, that would probably have impact. That the ruling could have impact on this general part of the test of the Selmer test. I mean, just to conclude that the situation on ground in Poland is even worse than in 2016 when the Selmer was, was decided. And that would be only difference for domestic court. I mean, that would be just, but he, still the court is not able to refuse, you know, the, um, the, the execution of the Polish decision, whatever, uh, because there has to be, you know, the second uh, part of this test. And that is, you know, very individual threat to, to a fair trial, which you cannot build on the basis on this ruling. But that might end, you know, with the preliminary reference uh, going back to the Court of Justice again and give another chance to the Court of Justice to really rethink uh, their, their assessment of, 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 this, of this test. And that would might also mean that probably the Court of Justice will have to introduce Xero Flor ruling from Strasbourg into their jurisprudence and then what will happen is actually what the tribunal wrote in the in the ruling that you know they will question their status as a, as a judge of the of the court of justice and i think then you know the whole game will start again on a totally different uh, level but as you can see the steps to go there is like at least 2 or 3 years um, to see what what will happen thank you barbara uh, christoph i think you had a, a response to the question yes thank you uh, at, the, at the risk of sounding a bit more alarmist, I, 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 I believe that some national courts might simply be tempted to ignore the Selmet case um, and test altogether. I mean, one should not underestimate the, the, the pressure under which national courts in, on the member state, in, in other member states are uh, at, at the moment. I mean, let's not forget that these national courts operate within their own national system and in order to keep their status their credibility their trustworthiness in their own system there will be a moment where executing blindly the decisions that come from a system which is becoming i mean for everyone to see more and more problematic it will be increasingly difficult for uh, the national courts diligently to respect the selma case um, and I, I don't exclude, and we have seen small glimpses of that already, right? The court in Amsterdam and, and other courts are, are, are beginning to wonder whether they're, they're really going diligently to follow um, the ECJ requirements of scrupulous recognition of, um, of decisions taken by a system which is increasingly problematic. Now, the paradox of that and I hope I'm too alarmist that I'm not suggesting that this is, this is going to happen, but the paradox of this particular scenario is that ultimately the national courts of member state are going to help the current government of Poland destroying the EU judicial order, right? Because, I mean, one element of that is that they're going little by little to exclude the Polish judiciary from the operation of the EU judicial order. But this is going to take place in an uncoordinated manner. It can happen you know, in Germany, in Greece, it can happen in France. Different judges in different member states can take different positions so that ultimately, this is going to be quite chaotic. Uh, and so 
my point is, uh, if I'm returning to something I was alluding to earlier on, um, if, if we, we want to prevent these decentralized disintegration, because this is what we're talking about here, first decentralized exclusion of Poland from a, a big part of the EU judicial and, and, and legal order more generally. And if we want to prevent that, that decentralized disintegration, then it's high time that those above do take their job or, or mandate seriously. And frankly, having seen the very poor, to say the least, performance of the European Council last weekend, I am not sure that national courts feel very reassured about the control by EU institutions and member states of the situation. And they are, therefore might have to take their own decisions. And, and that's pretty worrying to me. I think this is one of the most worrying dimensions of it all. As much as I agree with Michal that the, 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 the decision of the tribunal itself does not change, the very fact that it is being followed by certain courts in Poland does change the situation unfortunately. And that might again lay the ground for reactions by other member states courts. So it's, it's high time if uh, the European Council member state representative do care about the European Union that they should take the thing very, very seriously, which they don't seem to be at the moment. Thank you for that sobering assessment, Christoph, and, and thank you to the audience member for that question. I don't know if there are any other responses uh, on that point. Um, I may just add one point, if I may, um, to what uh, Christoph said um, about some judges now following this, this uh, uh, tribunal's judgment that we now have. I'm not entirely sure to what judgments uh, Christoph is referring to, because I have, I have no knowledge of such judgments being taken. But we need to take into account that this case law of the ECJ that now was opposed by the tribunal, it was never fully integrated in, in the Polish judiciary. It was never systemically uh, applied. We only have some cases from the Supreme Court in which the Supreme Court judges were trying to exclude the, the new colleagues. But on lower levels, this was never happening, probably because the Polish judges are afraid of potential consequences of, of, the, of the disciplinary action. So it's just that in this context, I do not see this particular judgment that we're discussing today as fundamentally changing something of the ground. It doesn't mean that I disregard it, definitely not. I, I think it's just very constructive. It, it would be more constructive to, to try to deal with it with whatever even the final instruments that we have, but, but I don't see it as fundamentally changing the situation. That's, that's all, all what I want to say. Thank you very much, Michal. Um, I'd encourage the audience to, to keep providing questions and we will come to them, but I'll, I'll pass the floor over now to Dimitri, who I believe has a, a question or, or an observation for the panel. What an exciting panel. I knew that the situation was bad, but Barbara Michal, the reading of the of the actual press release, or let's call it the judgment, uh, since it was published in the official in the official gazette, uh, it, it it sheds even new light on on the ruin of the of the of the of the Polish uh, judicial landscape, and in this or judiciary landscape. And in this context, I would like to uh, to focus on what what is to be done. And here I would connect with what Antonia said, with what uh, Christophe said. Of course, money are on the table and the threat of taking away the money uh, is, is significant, but uh, I, I wonder how significant it is in the face of a, an overwhelming willingness, political willingness to make sacrifices in the name of uh, this uh, abstract, uh, uh, om omnipotent uh, uh, destruction of, uh, of, of uh, checks and balances in, in, in the Polish constitution. And in this sense, uh, uh, Christoph mentioned Article 7, and uh, given how, how the Commission and the European Council have been performing, uh, do we really have any reasons to hope that Article 7 will change anything? Uh, and see, here is my suggestion to push it further and to allow the willing member states uh, to, move, to move on even further than Article 259. Would it be possible to follow the Austrian route and simply to harass Poland as it were with swi generous uh, deployment of the, of the freezing of bilateral ties between the member states and Poland, 
uh, even better so if, if those bilateral ties freezing is coordinated at the supranational level. I will remind the audience that when, uh, when uh, uh, proto Article 7, so called proto activation, uh, took place in, in the Austrian case, there was no Article 7 1. So the member states simply agreed together to freeze ties with Austria acting outside of the framework of EU law. So could it be that actually stepping outside of the framework of EU law uh, could help us solve this issue with Polish constitutionalism and with EU law as such, or the, rather the conflict between the two? Thank you for that very rich question, uh, Dimitri. Perhaps we could um, start with Antonia and, and the points that Dimitri made there about whether budget sanctions will even be effective uh, in light of maybe the ideological nature of this project and we can open up the floor. Yes, thank you. Yes, I completely agree that uh, probably even uh, conditionality is not enough, will be not enough even if triggered, uh, which is something that we need to, to see yet because there are a lot of uh, uh, veto about uh, the concrete activation of the rule of law conditionality. I, I agree. Uh, that it is a limited tool uh, to tackle such a deep uh, crisis, uh, such a national, uh, political uh, national crisis. So uh, in my view, the European Union cannot go uh, too far within uh, in solving the uh, democratic uh, backsliding in Poland. So it is inherently limited. But uh, if uh, we should look at what we have in our hand today, for sure, the use of money is uh, our chance today, because we are talking not only about in general European funds, but all the funds related to the next generation EU, which is a huge amount of money. And uh, I think that uh, if uh, the Polish government will uh, keep uh, um, uh, maintaining this confrontational attitude, the Polish people will blame the, uh, the government not to have taken the chance of receiving such uh, uh, funds from the European Union. So uh, I am fully aware of the limitation of this tool, but uh, I think that uh, it is uh, at least uh, a further step in the uh, fight to this uh, rule of law backsliding because we well know that uh, so far uh, the, all the rule of law toolbox has been quite ineffective and uh, I would take uh, this chance to apply uh, strict conditionality, um, strict rule of law conditionality, both under the general European funding and specifically within the next generation EU funding. Thank you very much, Antonia. And um, maybe we can then open up to the panel if they have observations on budget or the other part of Dimitri's question about this um, almost going outside of the EU framework, applying diplomatic pressure, which maybe speaks a little bit to a point Christoph was making about the responsibility of the other institutions to act. So if anybody has any observations on that, Barbara. Um, I guess that the Austrian uh, scenario is not possible as long as we have the same German government in office. I mean, Angela Merkel recent uh, remarks, you know, trying to stop discussion about sanctions and rather, you know, looking for uh, for dialogue would mean that uh, such scenario is not possible as, as for the time um, being. Money, in fact, is important factor, but for domestic politics right now in Poland, since there are suggestions that if um, Prime Minister Morawiecki will not bring EU money home, he will lose his office, he will lose his um, position, and he will not be Prime Minister anymore. Besides the first um, also information that Tusk you know, got uh, sort of um, assurance from EPP that yes, the money will go to, to, to Poland. It, it basically says that the money is not uh, probably the, the, the major um, factor in the discussion. Uh, however, what is interesting, and I will refer very briefly to what uh, Christoph said about 259 and, and possibility of using this one, it's actually Poland who wants to use 259 against Germany dealing with the appointment of judges in, in, in Germany. It's 
of course it's illogical and they're going to lose the case but if they want to introduce such case in front of the of the court of justice that would mean that according to them appointment of justice is covered by the by the treaties and that would completely destroy their their logics of, of, of arguments saying that the court of justice cannot rule in polish case because they're trying to rule the, um, and trying to litigate the exact same case in front of the court of justice so this is just you know defense by, by attack from the polish government i believe we had a, a question that was also following up for dimitri just on whether he believes that the austrian case he refers to was actually a success story or not uh, that's a great question because uh, austria was of course the loss of face for the eu because uh, when when the wise men uh, arrived in austria they discovered that nothing terrible was going on so I was not, uh, and uh, I apologize if I if I could be so easily misunderstood. Uh, what I was referring to is not the successful outcome, but an additional tool which we definitely uh, have in the palette of tools uh, on the side of the EU if we want to intervene forcefully. And the and what I want to say is that the tools are not limited by Article Seven, by the by the conditionality regulation, and by Articles two five eight to five nine to sixty. But we could we could also think about a more creative deployment of our capacities uh, in terms of uh, temporarily stepping out from the framework of uh, of what the EU provides for. And there are plenty of examples of that, uh, which, uh, in substance, again, we can agree or disagree whether they work like the EU Turkey deal, but the Court of Justice says it's okay and it's not, uh, strictly speaking, within the ambit of EU law. So as long as the, this possibility is there, we could uh, creatively think about using it. Wonderful, thank you very much, Dimitri. Uh, sadly, we're, we're running out of time, but I think we can perhaps combine um, a few questions we've received. So we've had a final question from Facebook, which was directed specifically to Michal about whether, uh, Mihal, do you understand that the decision is merely symbolic or do you see any potential for it to lay the groundwork for later judicial action by either the constitutional tribunal or other Polish courts? And perhaps this also connects with a question we've had from Teodora Miljovkovic, who's uh, an assistant editor, about whether um, you believe that the full judgment might contain a new a liberal doctrine of the rule of law and judicial independence uh, on the basis of the press release stating that the ECJ's interpretation of Article 19.1 is contrary to Article 2 of the Polish uh, Constitution. And then maybe just as, as a final point, uh, um, as moderator, I can abuse my position to ask a final question. Do the panel believe that there are any prospects for resolution at the domestic level that could happen purely through interpretation, as Michal was alluding to, or perhaps through new appointments and overturning? Or would there need to be a more fundamental constitutional reform of the tribunal, as, for example, we have seen being discussed in the Hungarian case by, by the opposition? So, yeah, perhaps uh, three, three questions there that, that link to similar themes. So I'd, I'd open up to the floor on that point. Miha, I don't know if you have any observations. Yeah, yeah sure. These are uh, this is a lot of questions actually, and they are very difficult. But uh, let me just emphasize one more thing: that what we have now is the operative part and a press release and short oral motives on a video recording. So it's very and it's also very difficult for me to foresee what will be contained in the full decision because already in a press release I see some logical inconsistencies. And I generally consider this body to be completely unpredictable. So I don't know simply what will be contained in, in the full decision. Uh, it may have um, some effect. Um, so firstly, what I see and what I find particularly troubling, it was emphasized in the oral motives, is that the reporting that judge clearly said that in the future they see the potential for reviewing or opposing, if you like, individual ECJ decisions that they don't like. They presented this very weird theory that the ECJ judgments are part of the treaties. So since the tribunal has the jurisdiction to assess the constitutionality of the treaties, then also ECJ judgments. That's that's very weird to me, but, but they alluded to that. So uh, th this only confirms probably that the tribunal may be again used in the future as a tool to resist particular ECJ judgments that the government doesn't like. But to me, this is only one more argument to, 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 to show that this is not a real, a real tribunal. It's just a, a legal unit of the Ministry of Justice, if you like, or quasi-legal unit of the Ministry of Justice. Um, 
And now regarding, because there is here just one very interesting question, is it possible that they will present some illegal, illiberal doctrine of the rule of law and judicial independence? Personally, I don't think they have any particular conception in mind or any coherent doctrine they want to enforce. To me, it's all about individual decisions that they, re that they, that they reject, that they try to oppose. For instance, here in this judgment, it's about one fundamental thing. They, um, the tribunal thinks that the new council of judiciary is uh, compliant with the Polish constitution and does not endanger judicial independence. Everybody else, European courts, Polish judges, Polish associations of judges think otherwise, but they simply have a different opinion on this particular issue. And I have to say that I don't see any justification in the press release, any specific arguments as to why, for instance, the assessment of the ECJ is flawed. They simply say, we just have a different opinion. And, and that's it. So to me, this is not, I, I don't see here any specific different conception of judicial independence. It's just a uh, it's just the application of, of judicial independence concept in a particular way, which seemed very arbitrary to me and, and, and not justified. And I would say the same with, with the rule of law. On the rule of law in Poland, one last sentence, I, I see it as a more, as a, as a longer process. I, I, I see some damaging, especially, especially this, uh, this, this disciplinary regime which gives to the judges this, 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 they have to be aware that every time they give a judicial decision, they have to be aware that there may be consequences of the disciplinary, on, on, on disciplinary grounds, uh, and the disciplinary proceedings will effectively run and governed by the executive. And, 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 and this is ongoing, and, and for now, EU institutions or, or no one was able to stop that. Stop that. So that's a continuing, um, continuing deterioration of the rule of law state in, in, in Poland. I, I see it like this, thanks. Thank you very much, Miha. We have just a few more minutes. So if any other members of the panel would like to offer any closing observations and the, the floor is yours. Dimitri, I don't know if you had a, a final point that you wish to make. Well, we are in a difficult situation, but uh, I think in the long run and uh, uh, it, it makes sense uh, to 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 finish this on, on an optimistic note, mm -hmm. because for the first time in its history, the European Union is testing its own ability to live by its values, even against the stated adherence to the values uh, in all the member states, which is which is uh, an immense uh, opening for our supranational constitutional system, because this constitutional system will uh, will be able to prove that uh, what is stated in the documents actually is what, is, uh, what, what the system is living by uh, through its own enforcement powers and through its own uh, functioning of own institutions. So I believe Poland and, and Hungary as well, let's say, uh, provide a, an immense service uh, for the future of the European Union to make it a better and uh, smoothly functioning institutional system, which we all believe in as reflected in Article 2. Thank you so much. If I, if I may, just one, one more question, but one last point, but I promise one last point. Uh, I think everything depends on Polish courts and how, will, how they will approach this judgment in the future. There are doctrinal arguments they can use to neutralize this judgment. And to me, all the cards are on the table. As I mentioned before, the Constitutional Tribunal is not the only interpreter of the Polish Constitution. The Supreme Court, the Supreme Administrative Courts, and other judges, they, 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 it's also their instrument, their, the Polish Constitution. So they have to be brave and continue fighting, I think. Thank you, Michal. And let's hope there will be more optimistic notes for us to discuss as this debate surely rages on. So thank you so much to Barbara, Antonia, Christoph, Michal, and Dimitri for providing a fascinating debate. And thank you to the audience for tuning in. We'd encourage you to follow RevDem on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn and uh, to join us again for debates in the future. Thank you very much.